check, can you hear me? Hi. Uh, hi, my name's Cliff Schroders. I'm a PhD candidate at Murdoch University in Western Australia. Um, I've developed a new way of restricting applications and it's designed to be easier to use than previous approaches at restricting what each program on your computer is allowed to do. So my talk's divided into two parts. The first part's about the problem. So you can't trust the programs that you run tacked on your behalf, and there's lots of reasons why you can't. Um, and the previous solutions to these problems have all been quite hard to use or impractical. So there's lots of reasons not to trust the programs that you run. Um, there's a recent report from SAMS that said that one of the biggest problems facing security at the moment is end users programs that are misbehaving, um, such as with vulnerable software. So for example, you've got a legitimate program that you trust, the authors have good intentions, but they've made a single small mistake in their code which has allowed a remote attacker to basically take control of that program. But because that program can do anything you can do, um, that's not a good situation to be in. So for example, Adobe Reader has had you know, a few problems where you maliciously craft a PDF document, send it to someone, they open that and boom, I've got control of that program running on that person's computer. Um, and obviously malware is a huge problem, particularly in the Windows world, but Linux isn't immune to the problem, um, where you've got an author who wants to do something bad on your computer. Um, and say you download a program from a web page, you know, do you, do you trust that program? Um, you've got your, say you've got all your software through repositories, do you trust everything, every step that's been involved in getting that there? Um, the answer is you shouldn't have to trust it. And there's been lots and lots of, you know, interesting related security problems that have happened even in the last couple of years, DNS problems, um, you know, certificate problems, and you shouldn't have to rely on the programs to behave correctly. Um, so if you end up with malware on your computer, basically that malware is running with you, your user identity and can do anything that you can do on that system. And the problem, this is a problem because the traditionally security systems have been designed not to stop what programs are allowed to do, but to stop what users are allowed to do on the system. So you're specifying, well, this user is allowed to do this, this, and this, um, and that's designed to stop users from interfering with each other, but you know, the, this doesn't solve the problem of what programs are doing on behalf of those users. And it, it assumes that the programs are acting with the best interest of the users acting on their behalf, but obviously that's not always true. And you can't, you know, you shouldn't have to trust that it's true. So for example, on um, Windows or Linux, traditionally it's based on a discretionary access control. So that just means that each user decides what other users are allowed to do with the files that they create. Um, and that doesn't solve this problem, right? And mandatory access control traditionally is about restricting what each user is allowed to do from uh, an administrator's point of view, and the users have no control over that. That still doesn't solve the problem um, the, the traditional way of doing that. So then the reactive approach to solving the problem was, OK, so we'll patch the vulnerable software. Uh, Adobe Reader's got a bug, you know, um, fix it, and then hope that everyone starts using the new version as soon as possible because there's, you know, in the meantime, there's, you know, a gaping vulnerability that can be exploited. Um, and scanning for, for known ma malware. So, oh, we just learnt about some new type of malware. Better make sure we're checking for that next time. But that's not solving zero-day attacks. So a zero-day exploit, there's nothing you can do. You don't know the vulnerability exists yet. They can't fix it. Um, zero-day malware, so basically a new form of malware. I sit at home, I ride a new Trojan horse and send it to someone. Um, unless I do something really obvious, it's pretty easy to, to make sure that that's not going to be detected because it's a new form of malware. So recently, there's been sort of a, a range of solutions to this problem being proposed. And the, this is more of an application-oriented access control. 
So you're saying what each program is allowed to do. And this is a huge improvement because you can say this program here is only allowed to do this, certain things, and you know, we know that it can't go and you know, copy all of my files and upload them to the internet or you know, whatever it's trying to do. So the previous solutions can basically be divided into two groups. So you've got an isolation type approach, so your traditional sandbox where you, um, but, you know, things like chroot, jails, VMs, containers, you know, you might create a whole virtual machine just to whack a program in it, and then that, that program can only act in this little limited space. Um, so you might just restrict it to a, a, a namespace, you know, so that it can only access a certain, certain things. Um, the problem with that solution is that's not how most people work. So say you've got one program that you create a file with, you then edit it in another program, you might view it with another program and then upload it onto you know, your social, you know, Facebook or whatever you want. Um, so it's not a flexible solution um, because as soon as you've got sandboxes that are completely isolated and you need to try and get things into the next sandbox, then that's quite difficult. <clears throat> and then the other group of... Um, the other type of solution is more of a restriction approach. So we're talking about things like AppArmor, SE Linux, uh, SysTrace, Tomoyo, and basically these have a more fine-grained approach. And you say this program is allowed to access, you know, this particular file. This, so you've got Firefox. Okay, you're allowed to access your configuration files. You're allowed to access these libraries. You're allowed to access um, particular networking resources. Um, and as I described that, you're probably saying, probably already can figure out what the problem with that is. You get very, very complex policies um, that can be hard to use and manage. So you've got a system that, you know, if you're not relying on someone else to just set it up for you, if you actually want to get in there and say, well, I want Firefox just to be able to access this and, you know, put files in this directory, very hard to configure. Oh, I just... There's a few people in here, so this will be interesting. Can I see a show of hands? Who, anyone who's used any of those systems, even if it's just... Um, yeah, have you ever used a restriction-type system? So that's AppArmor, SE Linux, anything like that. Um, did any of you turn it off? It was too hard to use? Okay, so that's like quite a big percentage of the people who had their hand up the first time. That's all I need to say. So it shows that there, you know, there's a problem. Um, so... The, the, um, the approach that I'm proposing is that you take a functionality-based approach. So basically, you know, to, you define what each program is allowed to do based on the features that they provide. So, for example, if I'm going to restrict Opera, I would say it's a web browser. Um, and then if that's all I said, that's all it would be allowed to do. And I'd go, well, uh, it's also an IRC client, an uh, email client, and then... Obviously, there's a little bit more involved than that. So the devil's in the detail, but that's the basic idea. Um, so the access control model that I proposed uh, in my PhD research is called functionality-based application confinement model. Um, and I created a prototype for Linux, um, which is known as FBAC LSM, so it's a Linux security module. Um, and the, the core idea is that you have what's known as a functionality, which is a policy abstraction. And that basically contains all these details that we're talking about, complicated policy, um, and it's hierarchical. So that means that one functionality can be made up of other functionalities. So, for example, web browser functionality is made up of HTTP client, FTP client, etc. So, the, you know, it hides the detail, encapsulates detail, uh, and it's parameterized. So you can feed in information to give it application-specific informa um, information. So the powerful abstractions, which simplifies policy management. And the great thing about it is it allows you to create policy using high-level ideas and goals. So rather than saying, do I want this program to be able to access this particular library or configuration file, you're saying, uh, what do I want this program to be able to do? Um, and... It, as I said earlier, it encapsulates detail uh, and it you know, gives you abstractions to work with. So, luckily you don't have to understand the diagram 
in order to use the system, but that's a diagrammatic representation of the system. And the most important part in there is the relationship between applications and functionality. So you say, I've got an application. These are the functionalities I want it to provide. Um, and you can see that you specify parameters and blah, blah, blah. Um, so some of the other cool features is that it provides discretionary controls and mandatory controls. So in other words, users can use it to specify what they want programs to be able to do. So, OK, as a normal user, as long as my administrator lets, administrator lets me, uh, I can specify what Firefox is allowed to do while I'm running it. Uh, but the administrator can also use the system to specify if, if any of the users run Firefox, this is what it's allowed to do. And you end up with an intersection of what those two things are. Um, there's a graphical tool that guides you through the process, automates a lot of what you need to do in order to get the policy running. Um, and you can do it usually without having to use a learning mode. So I don't know if you've ever used, um, say, AppArmor. It's a great system. But one of the problems with creating a policy is you're confronted with a lot of prompts. And you need to think a lot about each of the specific files that program tries to access. So create a policy for Firefox is like, do you want to access this file, this file? You know, you need to vet each of those things. So one of the cool things about this is because of the already collected what most, of pro most programs that do this sort of thing does, just by saying it's a web browser is usually enough to get it to be able to do what it needs to do. Um, learning modes are available if you need it. So just to give you a quick overview, you have a process, tries to do something by a system call. The Linux security module you know, figures out whether or not it's allowed to do that. It knows whether or not it's allowed to do it because it's been fed the policy from user space. So a part of my research, I um, analyzed just over 100 programs um, and came up with some functionalities that the program uses. Um, just some examples to give you an idea. As I've said 100 times now, there's the web browser game, video player, audio player, things like that. And while I was doing that, looking at how we can automate the specification of policy when you actually, a user's actually using the system. And then once I created the Linux prototype of the system, I ran a usability study. So I got 39 participants. Um, they used three systems. They all used SE Linux, AppArmor, and the new system, FPAC LSM. Um, and they tried to confine three pro, uh, two programs in the three systems. So they tried to confine Opera, which is a web browser, and also confine a Trojan horse. They didn't know it at the time. They told it's a Tetris game. But it's, it was actually a Trojan horse simulation, so it's actually going off and trying to do as much stuff as it can. Um, so. Some of the people, to give you an idea, um, there were people from the Perth Linux user group. So there are a few people that had quite a lot of experience with Linux. Lots of students from Murdoch University uh, with varied backgrounds in computing. Um, and also a couple of computer security um, people who work in industry. Um, and some of the data, I'll just give you a really quick overview of the results now, but obviously there's more. Um, some of the data collected included the system usability scale. So it's basically a tool that's been verified that can give a score out of 100 for usability. Um, and also um, did a count of how many threats were actually left on the system after they finished. So how many of those program files were, they, were those programs left in a state of being able to access? So the usability score, so this is a score out of 100. Um, SE Linux got just under 35 out of 100. AppArmor just under 55 out of 100. And the new system of just over 70 out of 100. Um, and there's um, analysis shows statistically significant results. So it's not by chance that these are the results that we get uh, between each of the pairwise comparisons. Um, so there's literature that suggests that 70 is the cutoff point of being an acceptable system. So obviously, even the new system isn't perfect, and there's a lot of room for improvement. But um, you can see that it's easier to use than the other two systems. And the 
how successful they were at actually restricting programs um, has the opposite trend. So um, there's a few things we can say from this. Uh, SE Linux didn't do, didn't fare very well in this respect, and it has a lot to do with the fact that you need to use the command line interface quite a lot to create policy. So um, a, a lot of the users weren't comfortable with that level of, of detail, and obviously it's not really what SE Linux is designed for. I mean, you talk to an SE Linux expert, and I tell you it's probably best to leave configuring SE Linux to not to the end user. Um, App Armor, you can see, left quite still quite vulnerable, and you can say that's probably to do with like click click happiness. So it's like click 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 click. It's like, you know, does this program get to access this far? Yes, no. Yes, 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 yes. You hear click, 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 click. Yeah, so, and then with FBAC OSM, get slightly better results. Better results. So, now I'm going to do the first live demonstration I've ever done of the system. It shouldn't take very long. It's going to be similar to the task where the users had to confine the Trojan horse program. So um, the program is KSERTET, which is a Tetris game. It's been modified to be doing all kinds of evil things. So I'll just run that program. And the reason it's taking a little minute to start is because it's off doing all those things, which most, well, hardly any of the users figured out that it was even doing. Uh, and yeah, OK, it looks like Tetris, cool. Um, Cool. So the game works. It looks fine. Oh, yeah, that looks legitimate. Cool. Um, so just to give you an idea of some of the things the program's actually doing, um, or I, can, I can ask it to give the score of all the things that it's just accessed. So we can see here it's accessed a whole lot of networking stuff. Um, it's, you know, allowed to access... The shadow file, so obviously this is a system misconfiguration that this user is allowed to do that in the first place, but system configura misconfigurations is a big problem. Um, you know, it's accessing all of Opera's browsing history and blah, 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 so it's allowed to do that. Okay, cool. So what we should have done before we ran that program is create a policy for it to specify what the program's allowed to do. So using FBAC LSM, we can use this little graphical tool to create a policy. So, if we add an application to the list of the applications that are being confined, tell it the name of the program. Um, and it tries to automate as much of the information as it can. So it says, okay, we figured out the location because you gave us a name that made sense. Um, and this is where, um, okay, so just determine that it's a graphical program. So it's going to give it the privileges that most graphical programs will require. Um, at the moment, it's trying to suggest what functionalities are probably appropriate for that program. And the way it does that, it looks at what libraries the program uses and what dependencies it has. Um, and based on that, it'll try and give us a suggestion, although we're free to choose any of the functionalities that are in here. So that might include things like, um, you know, is it a BitTorrent client or an email client or whatever. So it just takes a minute to think about that. And uh, the other way that it can suggest um, functionalities is based on the icon category that the program has. So anyway, it said it's probably a game or a network game. Um, because of the website that I downloaded it from, I know that it's not really, it's not advertised as being a network game, so I'll just say it's a game. Uh, yep, okay, so the devil's in the detail. Now it's trying to figure out some of the details of what that program needs to be able to access. Um, we can just uh, say, yep, I'm happy with what you've just figured out there. Um, I'll explain what some of these things mean. It's asking for the parameter of the per user file. So it's saying, um, you know, the, the, do they have files in their home directory that looks like it's for this program? Now, because we ran the program, this Trojan horse, before we started creating policy, it's already inserted itself into auto, auto startup. Uh, so we'll re remove that. But if we'd created a policy before we'd ran the program, then all would be good. 
Um, I know for a fact that it's not going to find anything here, so I'm just going to skip looking for these things, some of these, just to make this a bit quicker. Um, basically, here it's got a list of values that we're supplying. You can remove, remove values from the list, um, add them manually. Um, you can change the values that are there, and you know, there's a few little things there. Which um, One of the suggestions that we got um, that I got during the usability study, so I got feedback about each of the three systems as well, is that it might be more usable to automate as much as possible before getting the interaction from the user. So rather than getting them to wait for each of the, to figure out each of these things, it might be better to do that in advance, but here it is. Uh, now it's looking for read-only directories that store resources for the program. I know for a fact it's only gonna find one, so I'll just stop it from looking. Um, uh, it wants to, wants to know whether we want to be able to save games in a particular directory. So I might have a, a directory in my home directory where I have games that I want to save. It doesn't apply in this case. Basically, it does a pretty good job of just automating those details. So obviously, um, yeah, and now it's asking me where do I want to store the policy. So I just store it with the other game policies. And that's actually all there is to it. Um, that might seem like, it, you know, it, it's, that's not perfect. I mean, it still involves a little bit of thinking. But by um, automating a lot of that, it does remove the expertise that's required of the end user to do that. Um, and if you've had any experience with other systems, you might recognize that it, 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 you know, it's an improvement on previous systems. Here we can. Um, Lots of ways that we can query the policy we've just created, look at all these low-level privileges that that then adds to that program and allows them to access. You can query it to actually check if it can access a particular file. And you can also look at how it's gonna be represented on disk. So we'll just um, reload the policy into the security system that's running. And as soon as that's finished loading that into the system, we can run the program again and check how it went. Not the fastest system in the world. Okay, cool. So now if we check to see what the program's allowed to do, can it go off and do any of those malicious things that it's trying to do? Um, no, it's been stopped. The only thing that's left that I've checked that, that the program checks for is it can run right to the temporary directory. Um, but you can see here that it can't write to any of can't read any of the Operas um, basically can't leak information that's not allowed to get to. It's been stopped from doing all these malicious things it's trying to do before. If we run that program as normal, the cool thing is it still has all the privileges it requires to operate as we expect it to. So it's trying and failing to do all these malicious things and the program still works cool. We have Tetris uh, without being Trojan horse. Well, it's still trying, but failing to do anything bad. Cool. The demo went with <laughs> it went well. <laughs> um, so that's the system and how it works. So some of you may have never collaborated or um, worked on any Linux projects before. I'd love you to help. Um, anyone in this room who's interested um, or watching this later who's interested in working on the project, I'd really love you to help collaborate on the project to make it better. Um, obviously, it's not, it's not a, it's not a um, production-ready system at the moment. It's sort of a pro, in a prototype stage. So any help that I can get, um, we can get as, to work together as a team would be awesome. Uh, so there's the URL for the project there. You can check it out. Um, you can grab the source code. There's um, pretty simple to grab that. Um, some of the future plans um, include, you know, in addition to cleaning up the code and making it more stable, um, is to introduce. What 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 I'm working on at the moment is exporting to AppArmor policies and SE Edit policies. So that's a simplified 
SE Linux policy. Um, because the cool thing about that is we'll be able, people will be able to um, get the usability advantage of, of the system while using other systems, the other security, uh, Linux security modules. Uh, adding context-based decisions, um, so things like stateful, you know, packet analysis and stuff like that, like are you actually using the HTTP protocol? Um, or uh, adding a notifier, so saying when, instead of silently blocking these things from happening, say, ding, that looks like something suspicious, maybe be aware that that program's trying to access something that we've just denied it from accessing. Um, and developing more policy and functionalities that we can use. Um, so the current status is it's functional, but unstable. It's currently developed against an older version of the kernel, um, because when I was working on my PhD, I discovered quite quickly that things move along at a rapid pace, and it was easier for me to do my programming than I needed to do by just working on a stable version of Linux. Um, and in the meantime, things have changed in the kernel. So it's currently developed against AppArmor LSM hooks, and policy has been developed against uh, KDE 3.5. But anyway, it, the, the purpose of the research was to test the idea and see if it looks good, see if it works. It looks really, has great potential. Um, and there, again, is the URL for the project. So please check it out. Grab the source code. Come and talk to me if you're interested in collaborating. I, if, you, if you're interested, I can burn a copy of a virtual machine or something with all the stuff that you need to get going. Um, so in conclusion, this demonstrated significant benefits to usability and consequently security. Um, so yeah, I'd love to answer any questions that you've got. Yeah. Just uh, hold on for the microphone so the streaming users can hear you. Hi, uh, it looks pretty good. Um, thanks for working on it. Uh, my, my question is that um, the usability benefits uh, mm. from our demonstration seem to come from automation uh, and um, classification and things like that. Yeah. Um, does that, do they require uh, features of the LSM module itself to be mm. able to do that, or could you apply the same techniques on, say, AppArmor? Yeah, yeah. So there are benefits of using the LSM that I've developed um, that you can't get from exporting it to AppArmor, but um, such as the fact that it's held as a hierarchical policy in the kernel, so you can disable chunks of that policy. So you say, uh, you know, you're not working as a web browser any anymore, you're an email client, um, and things like that, which you won't be able to do if you export it to an AppArmor policy. And also currently, as far as I know, AppArmor just has uh, mandatory controls, um, although I've, I know that they're working on adding discretionary controls as well. But the idea of adding export to it would be that you can then create a policy um, at, and export it to an AppArmor policy, and then you get the usability benefits from using the, the high-level abstractions to create policy. So yeah, I have h hopes that that'll work out, and I've good, made good progress on, on that. Cool. Um, and a, a simple secondary question was, um, mm. I, I, I thought I saw when you were um, speeding through at the end of the demo that yeah. it was um, allowing access to uh, specific shared libraries rather than, say, yeah. user lib star, which yeah. seems to be quite fragile to me for updates yeah. and things like that. Um, I've taken an approach similar to AppArmor, who, who in their policy they take that approach of specifying specific libraries. Um, it's probably not that big of a security threat to let them have read access to slash lib, but that was just a policy decision that I made. But you could simplify policy by just saying, yeah, you can read everything in that directory. Um, probably they've got a good reason for taking that approach, but I just followed suit. Thanks. Um, if this was uh, enabled by default on a distro. Which won't happen for a while. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> how would that? Look, would, would who, mm. the package maintainer, would they use these tools to put together a policy for their package that would be shipped along with it? Yeah, well, the thing, I suppose there's a, the approach that you could take is have, um, I did sort of zoom through, if I just quickly go back to here, you can see there's a list of confinements here. I've got my own discretionary confinement where I can supply policies. There's also a mandatory policy confinement where system administrators can specify policy. 
Um, probably if you had policies that were specified by the authors, you could have a separate confinement to do that. And the reason why I would, would have both, personally, although you can argue you can trust the people that develop the programs, that wouldn't actually solve the problem of malware, because if the person writing it is also supplying the um, policy, then you kind of have to, you're trusting them to make, get that policy right. But it, it would be good for if people actually producing the pro programs provided their own policy um, yeah, if, if because you, it's easier. If you trust them, then that would be easier. If you decide you're trusting your distro guy, I mean, you're getting the kernel mm. off the distro maintainer and things anyway, right? So if you decide yeah. you're trusting the distro, then there's no need for each individual to go through and say, yeah. this is a web browser. This and is I believe browser. that's the approach that Alfama and SE Linux take. Is, I mean, Alfama starts with a few policies and they have a repository of some other policies that people have created. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's an extra level of trust that you need to have in the people that are creating the policies. And to an extent, you have that in the people, or myself, who've created the functionalities that those functionalities are just doing what you want the program to be able to do. But, you know, it's all open, so you can check it out. And, you know, many eyes show their bugs. Yeah. Don't attack me for attacking SA Linux. <laughs> And yeah. I'm an SE Linux developer. So. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering with the usability study, mm. you said you use the command line tools for yes. SE Linux. Because well, there's some sorry. Practical... I, um, they used um, policy gen, the policy generation tool, which is uh, the user, it's a graphical tool that they can use to create basically skeleton files that they need to create their own module. Um, and then there's a couple of commands you need to run to, you know, actually fill that um, because... The, the, the graphical tool only takes you so far. Um, yeah. Okay. But I did use as much as I, I, I used as much graphical tools as I could to get them to, you know, um, I gave them all the graphical tools that there were available. But unfortunately, there's still a gap where you need to do some stuff on the command line. Uh, but that's something that, that is definitely, I would recommend that the SE Linux people as yourself do. I mean, Adding a, a tool that basically steps you through that process of, you know, when you use the um, audit to allow, you know, you might want to step the users through each of those rules that it's adding, um, rather than just giving them a clump of rules which will solve their problem. Um, that's just a suggestion, but I don't know. Uh, what sort of policy would you set for something like uh, the Java Virtual Machine, where you don't know what programs you're going to be running? Yeah, so that's outside the scope of this particular policy, but um, in my thesis, <laughs> I describe things which I haven't implemented. So that would include um, uh, being able to... Um, well, some, some... Okay, so one of the things that it does do is when, um, say you're creating a policy for a um, Perl-based program, it detects that it uh, has a dependency of Perl and then will suggest you add that to the program and that will allow it those extra things that all pro Perl programs need to be able to do. But when you have something like a Java virtual machine, um, it, yeah, they, I, I'd, I'd love to talk to you about it some more <laughs> afterwards because there is, a good, there, there is an answer to that, but it's not simple. Any more questions? Uh. Um, have you got any feel for how these would survive uh, routine updates, like security patches, things like mm -hmm. that, version updates of uh, libraries or whatever? Yeah, well, when I was um, analyzing the programs to create the functionality so these policy abstractions, you've, I've found that a lot of programs that do the same thing, actually have very similar policy um, needs. And if a program changed dramatically and they solved the problem in a completely different way, then yeah, you'd need to add to that. Um, and there are tools on here, so you can use like this learning mode, which basically allows you to run the program and then it looks at what the program's doing and then suggests like adding specific rules to allow it to do those extra things. And then as a, that's what you do as a user, but if you, then you might tell someone who's creating the functionalities that 
hey, I've found that some people that have web browsers that are accessing this particular thing, and then that can be added to the policy abstraction. Or, yeah, so I think that in most cases, routine updates wouldn't cause too much of a problem, but obviously it's possible that they might suddenly require something new. But hopefully that wouldn't be too much of a drama. Cool, thanks. So yeah, please check out the website and um, grab the code if you're interested. And um, yeah, talk to me if you want to collaborate, because that would be cool. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, LCA 2010 would like to thank you for taking the time to come and present to us and uh, give you a bottle of this wonderful wine. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.